And in doing this, to really, one of the roles of the NIH, I think, is to catalyze scientific thinking, to get a lot of people thinking together from very diverse backgrounds, perspectives, et cetera, to think about um, this set of issues, really. In doing this, we, th we think we've created a process whereby the external community that's external to NIH will have lots of opportunities to really give us input about this through workshops, the web, in a way that I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes, and to also foster cross-collaboration um, with and between NIH, our partners at the NIH, some of whom are in this audience, and earlier speaking with students today, a number of the questions were how do we know which institute to go to and that kind of thing. It's a good question. We at NICHD really do enjoy working with other institutes. Uh, it gets better science done. Um, partly it's because we can pull our resources, monetary ones. Even more importantly, we often bring those different perspectives, different research communities together to look at the same issue. So we're very happy to work with other institutes and hope that this will help us do that and very involved in working with other, our other partners, other federal partners and non-federal partners in this. And we consciously, as part of this, we're to, want to involve early stage investigators and other new stakeholders in the conversation. It should not just be a bunch of people like me without hair anymore who are doing this. No, no aspersions of those of our fellow sufferers out there. Um, but we really do want to get younger people who don't know yet what is impossible and therefore are able to do those things and have some good ideas involved in this conversation as well because we are focused on the future in this. This is not a review of what we've done in the past. People sometimes said, well, gee, I've got an idea that might be interesting, but NICHD's never wanted to support it before. We don't care whether this is something that we've got, you know, six networks and 96 R01s that we've never been involved in. If it speaks to our mission, we're interested in that science. And it's really about the science, not sort of strategic institute planning specifically. So it's not about what we should be doing as an institute. It's what we as a community of researchers and a community of folks who are interested, a community of advocates, et cetera, should be, should be doing in terms of science. So what we've done is we had a number of workshops, nine workshops, all of which were organized by external scientists, many faces in the room, people who here who have participated in those nine workshops. And, uh, in, in one or more of the nine. They are each producing a white paper, a seven to pay, 10 page white paper, which is being posted on the web, and I'll give the URL in a couple of minutes. And they're there for public comment. Now often when someone from the federal government says to you, we would like public comment, what we're really saying is there's something, we put this out in the federal register, you comment for 60 days, and that creates a very thick file, which we then put in a binder, we put in the locked door of my desk, and if you come during you know, the right hours, you can come and look at it or something. This is actually not that. This is a functional kind of input where we get your input and it changes the way we think about things, and we would hope even the way we do things. So this is true public input we want. There's going to be a large meeting in June. Each of the workshops has been about 50, 60 people. The large meeting will be of a couple of hundred people to look at all of these white papers and see how can we improve them, what have we missed, what's fallen between the white papers maybe. Then our advisory council is going to review this. We will then be publishing this in a leading journal. Uh, that was our hope originally. I had a leading journal by anybody's definition contact me a couple of months ago and said, we hear you during this process. Can we publish um, your vision statement at the end of it? And I said, well, yeah, but wouldn't you be interested in maybe like seeing it first before you agree to publish it? Don't you have maybe something like called page limits? And they said, oh, yes, that's right. Um, well, can, can we have first look at it? So we're negotiating that. Uh, and then we are hoping beyond that to further disseminate it because, again, if this works, we're hoping this will be of interest to the community. Other funders, individual researchers, research teams, and thinking about what are the opportunities. And then we will use that, NICHD staff will use that to craft how, if that's a vision for the next 10 years of science in our fields, what do we do? What is our role in all of this? So we will be working to try to make that vision real. These are the nine themes around which the workshops were organized. And as you can see, at least five of them, I would argue, and in some ways I would argue all nine of them <laughs> have something to say about child development. So that I, I think you can uh, feel well assured that many of your interests came up in these workshops. These are the kinds of questions we ask people at the workshops to think, to think about. One of the ways of thinking about this is, 
gee, in 10 years, what should we as a community be able to look back on and be proud of? What is it that we would want to do to be able to say 10 years from now, look what we did. We figured this out. We made this kind of difference over that 10 years. We also asked uh, the participants to really think about these cross-cutting kind of elements that we thought went across a lot of those scientific areas, some of them across all of the scientific areas, to think about things. You'll be interested in the developmental lens. That's so intrinsic to the way our institute works, and we think to all of the sort of research areas in our institute to make sure that people thought of it that way and not think that they were dealing with somehow static individuals. Epigenetics uh, certainly features in this, again, to figure out how that plays a role in all of this functional status, et cetera, all of these things. Training and mentoring was something that we particularly um, asked people to focus on. So I want to give you, and I have to, these are very preliminary, even more preliminary than that beginning of fertilization, very preliminary um, stage of our thinking. And this is just a smattering. So I just sort of went through the nine workshops and pulled out some things that have to do with child development, um, and some of them apply more broadly. There were a bunch of issues that came up really with scientific data. How do we get it? How do we handle it? What do we do with it kind of thing that, again, are distinctive to child development, but I would argue would have a real impact in terms of child development. Part of this is, again, the idea of making data widely available, that um, a new belief system kind of, that data actually does not belong to the PI, particularly if it's PI has been paid by federal funds to garner it, that it actually belongs to society. We need to recognize in appropriate ways the intellectual contributions, the the, the time, the, the hard work of the PI, but we need to do that in ways that still allows the data to be used by others so that we can advance science as quickly as possible. Other kinds of things there. In the way we conduct studies, uh, we all say, well, gee, you need to validate that, but then we won't give you any money to validate that. Well, that doesn't really work. So we need to think about ways of doing that. Who's going to publish that validation? Who's going to validate the validation with the public? Hey, we need to think about that together. Um, all kinds of, of other things uh, that, are that uh, I hope will resonate with you there. We need to uh, have more creative ways, shall we say, to deal with uh, IRB issues, uh, the idea of harmonizing IRB so that, again, if we're going to have more and more multi-center trials, we need to have ways that really do protect the participants. I'm not talking about compromising that, but so much of what we do has nothing to do with protecting participants. It's to ward off lawsuits. We need to think about ways to structure our IRB's work so that they're actually effective, especially for multi-center trials. How we think about things, to get away from the sort of dichotomization that we've used too much in thinking about health and well-being, to say that people are either healthy or not healthy. People either have ADHD or they don't have ADHD and realize that so much of human experience, health, well-being exists on a spectrum. We all know that. And many of you have been good enough to think about it that way when you do your studies, but not all of us have. And we need to try to have the, what we study reflect the reality that so much of this really is in a dimensional system rather than the dichotomized one. And are we particularly important when we think about the next 10 years. Are we doing the research of the next 10 years to inform the future? Or are we doing it to deal with the maladies of the past? We need to make sure that we're looking forward, not backward, in, in the questions we ask. Other things about how we think. Um, interesting short discussion that happened in one of these about, you know, we all believe in improving children's lives, but who is it that gets to define improving? Uh, that's an interesting question that some people in their audience have devoted their lives to trying to figure out. We need to get beyond SES and not, uh, while that has some richness to it, to get beyond that and look at other issues that disadvantage uh, children and affect their development. A whole bunch of things about executive function. There are actually several slides, but I tried to distill it down. There are lots of other things besides that that came up. Cognition, again, lots and lots of things that came up uh, 
regarding cognition. That with these, I couldn't even distill down to one slide. And again, some of these things are already in the works, but just need to, uh, to be encouraged. Number of things involving intellectual developmental disabilities. So what really does cause cognitive impairment and Down syndrome? We know much more about that than we did 10 years ago, but we sure don't understand it. And if we do understand it, are there actually interventions that could make a difference there. A bunch of things, in some ways most important, I think, and this is not so much for the studies you do, but the studies people often do about disease states that purposely exclude kids with intellectual developmental disabilities from the studies. That's a reason for exclusion. Well, that actually makes a lot of sense as long as you make sure you have a world that has no kids with intellectual developmental disabilities in it. Then you've answered all the questions you need to ask. Uh, we don't live in that world. So we need, in fact, to make sure that we incorporate kids with intellectual developmental disabilities and adults, for that matter, with intellectual developmental disabilities in studies. We need to not use that as an excuse. And there's even a suggestion by some people that we ought to require, if you're going to not include such individuals, you need to give a good scientific rationale for that exclusion. Lots of things about therapies. And this, again, is just sort of a selection of some of them. For instance, engineering fibroblasts from a child with a neurologic disorder to become neurons, and then once you've done that, use those neurons that you've created essentially in a dish to screen drugs for effectiveness in repairing whatever the lesion is, the biological lesion that leads to the neurologic disorder. Talk about community factors, um, unsurprisingly. And to think about, for instance, as we think about resilience, and again, there are people in this audience who are already doing this, to think not just about individual resilience, but community resilience. What is it that makes some communities more resilient to various kinds of stresses um, than others? And if we can understand that, how do we then use what works in some communities, how do we transfer that to other communities that may not tend to have that same resilience? The idea of creating cultures of an investigation, that it shouldn't be sort of outside researchers helicoptering into a school setting or something to really think about creating teams in terms of parents, kids, teachers, et cetera. If we really want to do a effective research, if, even if we want to ask the right questions, we need to be doing that. Again, uh, recognizing the fact that kids actually live in the real world, not in our laboratories. Um, we need to really think about scaling from experimental situations into school systems for educational interventions. Uh, we need to, so there was a suggestion by a few people that we ought to have a national study of social environments, which would periodically sample their number, was households in tracts from 25 different metropolitan statistical areas, collecting social characteristics, et cetera, to follow those kids. Now, we hope we'll get a lot of that in the uh, national children's study, but this would do it in a different way. I saved this for last. I'm not going to go over this. This is my lead-in to uh, Greg's talk in a few minutes. Um, but you'll be glad to know that Greg's going to be talking to you about what was the number one hit from uh, all of these. This was the theme that came up every single meeting over and over again. How do we really do interdisciplinary science? We've gotten beyond the point where people question the need for it. So the question is, that's great that we almost all agree on the need for it. How do we really do it? And this is a major, I think, responsibility of all of us to work together to be able to do that. Just a few ideas that came from the group in doing that. <laughs>